For those of you who don't follow it or may not remember it, one of these really uh, evil people in the online world, out of whole cloth make up this story that John Podest and I are running a child trafficking ring in the basement of the Comet Pizza Parlor. By the way, there is no basement. Yeah, there is no basement. I'm not even... <laughs> but if you migrate that crazy story to Facebook posts, there are people who will believe that, including this very unfortunate young man in North Carolina believing that he was on a mission because he saw it on Facebook, he saw it in other places online, he saw it in, quote, news outlets, and so he was there on a mission of rescue. People could have gotten killed. Tonight, a terrifying moment. Authorities say a man with an AR-15 opening fire after police say he showed up at a family pizza joint. Welch drove six hours from Salisbury, North Carolina to self-investigate. A conspiracy theory called Pizzagate. Viciously phony rumors that the pizza joint was the base for a child abuse ring using underground tunnels led by Hillary Clinton and her campaign chief, John Podesta. This is insane. No one was hurt, but this became an alarming consequence of a growing online phenomena, fake news. The police say there is no sex trafficking conspiracy, but millions read about it on dozens of websites, including one called Danger and Play. Danger and Play is written by Michael Cernovich, All media is narrative, and we are in a war of narratives. There is a story about me. There is a story that I am just a very mean, awful, nasty troll. Is that the totality of who I am? No. Have I been mean before in the past? Yes. Here's Hillary's handler, and here's Hillary collapsing. <laughs> That's a narrative about me. I view it more in terms of sort of pro wrestling. Bill Clinton's a rapist! Bill Clinton's a rapist! And if people are gonna view you as the heel or the bad guy, you just have to play up into that role. Assault! They're assaulting me! They're attacking me! And, and that's what I've done is I've recognized that people were gonna misinterpret me, completely twist my words out of context, in, in many cases, fabricate things, and I can either spend all of my day explaining why that isn't true, or I can just embrace that heel role that you would as a pro wrestler. My name is Mike Cernovich, and I'm a journalist, author, and filmmaker. That's amazing. All right, so yeah, I just texted Scott Adams, which is, you know, Hey Scott, my latest film was on fake news and one area we wanted to cover was the role of cognitive biases playing fake news as well as your two movies theory. Would you be in for an interview discussing this? So I think Scott will do it. Um, that'll, But that would be what we would want to talk to him about. And he's, and, he's in the Bay Area, right? Yeah, he's in the Bay Area. I am Scott Adams. I'm the creator of the Dilbert comic strip. I'm a trained hypnotist and have studied persuasion for decades. In persuasion, uh, there's a thing called framing. It's how you think about a situation. People can frame things very differently, and skilled persuaders are especially good at it, so it's something I'm trained to do. Whoever gets there first, it's tough to get that out of your head. So going first makes a big difference. I've started doing a lot of live streaming on Periscope, and when there's a big story, um, I can be live to the world within minutes. I just pick up my phone and I'm, I'm live to the world. And the framing that I put on things, I'm quite aware of the fact that because I'm both uh, persuasive by training and I'm first, that my framing is exceptionally sticky. A lot of what we see as fake news is two movies playing on one screen. So if you took a bunch of the people on the right and a bunch of the people on the left and put them in the same theater and said, watch this movie, and when they left, they would, they would come out with completely different ideas of what they had just watched, even though they'd watched exactly the same thing. 
The director of controversial documentary The Red Pill is in Australia to promote her film, which has sparked protest. It's really quite an experience to have fake news written about you personally, and it's happened to me a number of times, usually in the form of somebody is imagining what's in my dark soul, and they imagine I hate something almost always that's completely off base. Until it happens to you, and you see it repeatedly, you, you can't really understand how powerful the fake news is, how much it changes you know, real people's lives, and how widespread it is. Oh, fake news. You're, I don't view you as a subject matter expert on fake news. Mm -hmm. You're a subject matter expert on you yes. and what the media has done with you. And I think people who have been printed in the media a lot can start to identify who is fake news because they know their true story more than anyone, right. and they can see who's not telling the truth. When I was 21, I enlisted my mother as my producer and camera woman, and we hit the road filming and made our first film, Daddy I Do, which looked at women's rights. Uh, and that film was really embraced and supported by Planned Parenthood. They funded a, a Northwestern screening tour of the film and flew us out and we did a bunch of screenings and had dinner parties and it was wonderful and, and it was really it was really supported in feminist circles. Uh, so we had a lot of success and uh, and you know everyone was saying that we had or that I had a bright future as a filmmaker because of that film and then my second big feature film was about LGBT rights and then I made a slew of short films about mostly about women's issues and that was kind of my brand and that was my reputation and and I had a lot of support in that. So act one, Cassie J goes to Hollywood. Act two, <laughs> everybody loves Cassie. <laughs> Let's go to act three. Uh, okay. A controversial documentary on the men's rights movement has had screenings in Melbourne cancelled after a petition claimed the film was misogynistic propaganda. Misogynist propaganda, anti-women. It is absolutely a propaganda film. It has made up its mind. Her name is Cassie J, and she's made a lot of people very, very angry. You don't really question their views in the did film. Did you see the film? About that. Why didn't you ask him about that? I did ask them about that. I mean, aren't generalizations like that dangerous? Because your publicist wouldn't send us the full thing. I sent you the screener link yeah, actually to the full night. film. She doesn't actually do the research. But many of the film's backers are MRAs. Men here. This is just a conversation where we want to talk about men and boys problems for just five minutes. All right, Cassie, we're out of time. We'll have to leave it there, but thank you very much for joining us. Initially, I thought I was going to be making a film exposing men's rights activists as misogynists, rape apologists, women haters, trying to turn back the clock on women's rights. And after that year of filming 44 people, I realized that the film I thought I was gonna make was not the truth of the story I got. I didn't change my views on gender equality. I actually expanded my views on gender equality that we should consider men in the equation but they wanted to make it seem like I was against women's rights. I mean, even some of the interviews I did on Australian news, the, the lower third where they would say the, the title of the episode they're, they're doing, one of the titles was, Filmmaker Changes Her Views on Gender Equality to inference that I am now against women's rights, which couldn't be further from the truth. But the project in Australia they put together a video package setting me up as a monster. And in their graphics, they said, the Red Pill movie was funded by men's rights activists. So many of the film's backers are MRAs. And it's just this little sound bite in an effort to discredit my entire, you know, last four years work. I did a Kickstarter campaign. Everyone knows no one has creative control if you're a Kickstarter backer. There are a minority of men's rights activists, a minority of feminists, and mostly people who didn't identify as either. And, you know, moving forward with my career as a filmmaker, I don't know how this smear campaign will have impacted my future opportunities. Um, when I started to see the media going after me, personally, like 
on a direct attack trying to take down my credibility and my reputation. Uh, I felt cheated and lied to for my entire previous life before I became this public figure with the smear campaign. I, I feel like how can I have trusted anything they've ever said about all these other people who I've seen smeared in the media before and I believed what the mainstream media said about them. First tonight, our report on the incendiary radio host, Alex Jones. He's known for promoting wild conspiracy theories. Over the years, his YouTube channel has racked up 1.3 billion views. He has millions of listeners and the ear of our current president. Your reputation's amazing. I will not let you down. You will be impressed, I hope. According to his own counsel, he is playing a character. But the idea that Jones doesn't necessarily believe everything he says may take some of his fans by surprise. He produces this show from his basement. Broadcasting worldwide, I'm your host, Alex Jones. So what is the state of our world today? The quickening, the intensification, the insanity, the wars. Why is Alex Jones in a movie about fake news? In fact, I bet when this film comes out, they're going to have reviews saying, ha ha, look at the filmmakers. To cover fake news, they talk to the king of fake news. Wait a minute. Even if that was true, you'd want to talk to the king of fake news. Mike Cernovich is here with some amazing established filmmakers uh, putting out this big film hoax dealing with mainstream media and fraud. And they asked me the question, are you an actor? When I engage in satire or acting, it's a joke when I say the things. I'm gonna go say some horrible things on air right now to illustrate how the globalists are sick freaks. It doesn't mean I actually believe the things I'm about to say. This thing's really tight on the eyes. So get ready. This is Alex Jones. This is Alex Jones being an actor. Let's go. You'll never defeat the human spirit. I'm a liberal. Uh, uh, uh. I apologize. I apologize. Jesus, forgive me. 1776 will commence again if you try to take our firearms. We're such self-centered crap that we don't even notice hell itself rising up. I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay. I've got the fire of human liberty. I'm setting fires everywhere. Kids, Magellan's a lot cooler than Justin Bieber. It, it doesn't bother me once you do it, whatever. I, I just, uh, if you guys want to put it out, just make sure, if you do do put it out, just make sure people don't have to pull muscle. It just looks like I'm a crazy person, uh, which I am kind of crazy already, but uh, let me just start over. Here we go. I wear many hats, but 99% of the time, I'm a father, I'm a patriot who wants to simply research the facts so we can live in a better world. And that's why since the time I was 21 years old, I've been on air because I've known there's been a war on for our minds. The victory will be an endorsement of a philosophy. Sir, shouldn't we abolish the CFR? That's the real reality that none of you will talk about, and most of you are members. And I'm being drug out, laugh at it. We need whistleblowers, and we need whistleblowers who aren't afraid of being smeared. Courageous people that are willing to step into the limelight and take the tomatoes being thrown at them. My entire career, it's been about putting myself out there to take the hit first, to draw the enemy out so that more people wake up to the larger picture. I knew Megyn Kelly was coming here to destroy me. I knew she was coming here to do the ultimate hit piece. And so I understood that I had to basically take her attack on so that I could use it as a way to educate my listeners and viewers on the anatomy of a hit piece. I think why smear campaigns happen to people like me is to send a warning to other people to not go off the reservation and do something like what I did. A warning to don't do that or we're gonna do to you what we did to her. Because when you're one of the main subjects that's been chosen uh, to be destroyed because they know that what I promote really does symbolize basic American values, if they can destroy that, they think they can really hurt their real enemy, that's the American people. We gotta take this guy out. Why you gotta take me out? Because I'm not part of the permanent political class. You gotta take me out because I'm a business executive and I can smell the rotting cadaver of Washington that sits in the basement of the American public and the American community. And I'm ready to help the American people remove the cadaver from the basement. You see, the, the, the way I was getting hit 
Uh, one of my buddies said to me, you're getting hit like that because you can articulate the president's strategy. I'm on BBC Newswatch and I'm being interviewed by Emily and it's a live presentation. I've got the White House behind me and we're talking, it's over, I shake her hand. I'm walking to my office in the West Wing. My cell phone's ringing, I pick up the cell phone. I'm not gonna tell you who it was, but it was a person in Republican opposition research for 30 years. They said, Ant, you're in a lot of trouble. You had great verbal dexterity on BBC Newswatch, and they're now saying, my God, this guy might be able to have tea with the queen. And I've gotten four or five calls on you since you finished that interview saying, what do you got on this guy? They got to find something on me. I sort of feel bad for them because they, they figured I'm Italian and they got 28 years on Wall Street. I had to do something dishonest. So they spent seven months like ripping through my financial records and background. I couldn't find anything. So they got me on three curse words. Leak thing and see if I can block these people the way I block Scaramucci for six months. They treated it like it was I, I, I poured hot water on a newborn baby. We had had hundreds of TV networks and newspapers call us in the month before Megyn Kelly called and I'd refused all the interviews because I knew that there was basically a bounty out to do a huge uh, deceptive hit piece on myself. And so when I heard that Megyn Kelly was calling up my producer, being sicky sweet saying, oh, here's my cell phone number. You know, please call me personally. I'm really into Alex, he's really cool. That right there was a giant red flag. And as soon as I call her, boom, she wants to go out to dinner with me. She's obsessed with me. She thinks I'm really handsome. But she thinks men that have a little pot belly like me are sexy. That the best men look like me. These are exact things she said. So I got my other phone and started recording it on speakerphone. You know, you just became very fascinating to me. I just sort of thought you were this maybe, you know, one dimensional guy. Like this is your thing. She promised me that it wasn't a hit piece, so that she didn't even want to get into the subjects. Uh, like Sandy Hook. It's not gonna be some gotcha hit piece, I promise you that. But of course, once she got here, she uncloaked herself. Sandy Hook, 9-11, that's the illegal a dodge. And she would take pieces where I'd said one thing 20 minutes before, the I love Satan, and edit that into something that was a completely other subject to make it sound like I was a stark, raving, babbling, stuttering volleyball or something, It's it's just, I just want to talk about you. I want people to get to know you. And the craziest thing of all would be if some of the people who have this, you know, insane version of you in their heads walk away saying, you know what? I see, like, the dad in him. I see the guy who loves those kids and who is more complex than I've been led to believe. So the media, and especially the fake news, can ruin lives fairly easily. I've had quite a bit of fake news lobbed at me. What was the, the fake news? Well, the fake news was that I'd said negative things about women, which if you saw them in context, you would understand that they weren't. But out of context, whoa, they sounded terrible. If I thought somebody actually thought the things that people said I thought, I would not like that person. And if you think somebody's evil, whatever comes out of their mouth is gonna sound pretty evil. And if you, th if you think that person is on your side, even if they say something that sounds a little bit evil, you're gonna say, ah, that's Bob. He doesn't mean that. So we imagine we can see what's in the soul of other people. It's the, the most classic mistake you could make. You're not good at peering into souls. You just think you are. <laughs> Everybody thinks they're good at it. Everybody's wrong. We're all terrible at it. And weirdly, we imagine that these normal people who would be our friends in any other context are actually like monsters on the inside. And, and it's pretty rare that anybody is actually a monster on the inside. This is the spot where it was first seen. Where did it come from? What is it? They're bringing crime, they're rapists. You know, I know nothing about David Duke. It's end of the world every day. 24 hour Trump horror fest. He tweeted again, you know, civilization's collapsing. Never in the history of the United States a monster of such horrifying hatred of man. They claim that they can hear dog whistles, secret messages embedded in the text. They have a special power for hearing what you said without you actually saying it. 
we can disagree with some or several of Trump's policies. I'm not here to talk about politics. I'm talking about what he said and how it compares to what the media literally portrayed him as saying. When Donald Trump kicked off his presidential campaign at Trump Tower, he goes down the escalator and he gives a speech in which he says, all Mexicans are rapists. This isn't just a general impression. I mean, this is something that was said repeatedly on CNN, Time Magazine, CBS, Washington Post, Politico, Huffington Post, repeatedly, time and again, we find them literally saying that Donald Trump said Mexican immigrants are rapists. A horrifyingly disturbing and grotesque thing to say. If Donald Trump said that, then absolutely he should drop out. The fact, of course, is that's not quite what he says. What he says is, uh, when Mexico sends people, they're not sending their best. They're sending people that have lots of problems. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. And some, I assume, are good people. And what he did say, you know, was graceless. It was inappropriate. But gosh, it wasn't. He didn't say that all Mexicans are rapists. That's just not what he said. He's complaining that somehow he thinks the Mexican government is sending people that have lots of problems. But the media fixated on two or three words, they're rapists, and decided that the noun there must be the worst possible interpretation, meaning all Mexicans. Every single Mexican, children, nuns, old people, all of them are rapists. And what a shame that Donald Trump said that. And he explained himself repeatedly. He went around praising Mexicans in multiple states again and again, saying they're good people, they're wonderful people. I want them to come in legally. The media never cared. What they cared about was this cartoon to not echo a stereotype, create a stereotype that I had never even heard of, that all Mexicans are rapists. What's stunning about these stories, these memes, is that even despite their being so incoherent, the media is able to just keep them going endlessly by systematically neglecting every shred of evidence against the story and reading between the lines with everything that seems a little off color. So here's another meme. During the campaign, Donald Trump called for the creation of a national database, a registry that would track all Muslims in America. Every Muslim American would have to be registered in this thing, uh, carry a special ID, perhaps wear a badge. This was echoed in countless many media. It's totally false. It just didn't happen. The proposal wasn't created by Donald Trump. It was made by a Yahoo reporter do you think we might need to register Muslims in some type of database or note their religion on their ID? This is Hunter Walker, Yahoo News, asking this to Trump. And what did Trump do? He didn't answer the question directly. You know, he's just interested in sticking to his message and saying the things he wants to say. It's known as the artful dodge. I mean, this is something politicians have been doing since for decades. Well, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to look at a lot of things very closely. We're gonna have to look at the mosques. Mm -hmm. We're gonna to have to look very, very carefully. He said, look, he said carefully. Now, when Walker reports this, what he says that Trump says, he says, he wouldn't rule it out. Then it becomes, he calls for the creation of a national database. And this expression shows up on CNN. It shows up on the cover of New York Times. The fascinating thing is how they seem to play a game of telephone, of taking not just what Trump says and twisting it, but they'll take what each other of them say that Trump said, and they'll add details. And Donald Trump again and again says, I didn't say that, that's false, this is ridiculous, it, I didn't start it, a reporter suggested it. Did they apologize? Did they at any point say, you know what, we want to go back over some of these stories we said, whether they're about, you know, religion or Mexicans, or, you know, let's do a tally of how many of these things we kind of twisted out of proportion. No, they're more interested in people tripping up on words rather than events. All kinds of things happen in the world. Alarming, important, urgent things. People die, people are dying. Serious things are happening and instead, the sad state of the media is what are they obsessed with? What is their number one concern? It's Twitter. I'm fascinated that the media is obsessed with whatever little white lie they think that I told on Twitter. How many people are dying because of whatever they view as being untrue that's being said by me? Now let's compare body counts. I'll, I'll gladly compare, they, they would have to frame me for body counts and shootings, as they did with the Pizzagate thing. I don't have to frame them, I just have to talk about what they've done. I, 
I, I measure things in terms of headcount. The biggest headcount for fake news is communism as a whole. Reasonable estimates are close to 100 million dead just in the 20th century from communism alone. There are a brutal number of uh, fake news stories covering up the hideous nature of communism and given that the facts are so easily available, given that the data is so easily available, I, I really do more than question. I, I have nothing but bottomless contempt for the people who cover this stuff up because they are aiding and abetting some of the greatest genocides in human history. And we know that Walter Durante of the New York Times would have got a Pulitzer for his reporting on the Potemkin villages under Stalin when he was toured around and, oh, look at these fat, happy workers, and, and they were just taken out of the gulag, stuffed full of chicken and thrown in front of his uh, eyeballs. Didn't Durante cover up the Ukraine invasion? Uh, the Holodomor, yeah. one, of the, uh, one of the unbelievable, brutal and overlooked um, genocides in many ways. So this is typically the way that it works. In a free market, resources tend to accrue to the people who are the most competent. And that's better for everyone because you want to have enough to eat. So you want the land to, to end up under the control of the most productive people. But the communists come along and say, okay, you're working for this guy, not because he's smarter or works harder or takes more risks or studies more, but because he's exploited you. He has stolen from you and we're going to get back what is yours. We're going to get back that land. We're going to split it up among you. So what they did was they went into the Ukraine, which was formerly called the breadbasket of Europe. The soil is so rich. I mean, it's just astonishing. And what they did was they took the land from the most productive people, called the bourgeois, the kulaks, the most productive farmers, and then they shot or imprisoned or drove off those farmers. The starvation that resulted, I mean, unbelievably horrifying stuff. This was all covered up. The reports were coming out, just as the reports were coming out about the Holocaust. The reports were coming out, but they did not examine it as much as they should have, and millions and millions of people starved to death as a result. And that helped stretch out the communist regime for another couple of decades, and it helped to spread the communist regime to other places in the world, uh, North Korea, uh, Cambodia, China. You know, there was a time when it was a third of the planet was under communist dictatorship. That had a lot to do with the intellectuals who came across and spewed the propaganda that they were fed. And they were happy to do it because they wanted to save the system, not deal with the facts. There are still people out there with Karl Marx buttons. You know, you try wearing a Hitler button, Hitler's head count was far lower than communism. You go out there with a Karl Marx button and people are like, oh, that's edgy. Or, you know, get your Che Guevara t-shirt and this proselytizing and, and pumping up of communism that happens. I mean, we see this recently. Women have better sex lives in Soviet Russia. I mean, like, okay, so sure, it's a hundred million death count, but at least I get a toe-clenching orgasm out of it. It's like, that's horrifying and horrible uh, kind of weighing in the balance. The fact that, that North Korea started as a communist state is very much overlooked. They, they put these Potemkin villages out there in North Korea as well, where you've got these happy peasants who see smiling and so on because, you know, they get shot if they don't. We traveled about four hours east of Pyongyang to visit a ski resort. We were also invited here, I would suspect, because it is not what people expect to see in North Korea, a modern uh, ski resort. It's got patriotic music and videos playing from a screen here and a lot of families out enjoying themselves. And the reason why it's so sinister, which you've talked about before, Mike, is that they want us dead. If you openly cover up for a regime that the first people targeted are people like you and me, I can't view this as a merely ideological dispute. This is not an academic difference in opinion, because if the system that they want gets in power, myself, my friends, my family, everything will be the first to go. Morning paper, morning star. Paper, mister? Your daily newspaper. Well, this is familiar. Most of us read a paper every day. The golden age of American journalism in, in the 50s is 
sort of a myth. Okay. Perpetuated by Hollywood and maybe journalists themselves. But it was golden in some ways. There, there were hard hitting reporters out investigating, trying to break big stories. And that image of a disheveled reporter who wants to get the story no matter what, in some way, is representative of reality. They, they did publish hard hitting stories. And print was king because TV was just baby stages. And there was a norm of objectivity then. Editorial stayed on the editorial pages very much. And the news tended to be very balanced and very fact-driven. The editorial writer must be able to write on many subjects. But instead of merely reporting news, he analyzes it and explains its meaning, often expressing his personal opinions. He must reason accurately and fairly and write in an interesting manner. There was also a different culture of the time, with, which was that objective truth does exist and that there are consequences for lying and doing this in the afterlife. Journalists, whether they were uh, practicing Christians or not, brought in this American ethic, which included God, absolute truth, also this idea that yes, there are objective facts that we can find and report. To be successful today, a newspaper must contain all the elements of the best journalism to fill the needs of modern newspaper readers. But beyond that, it must inspire complete confidence in its integrity. One of the key bits of information is a study that I did that fits right into the golden age of journalism that looks at American newspaper editorials from 1958 to 1970. And so starting in 58, I found that all of these papers uh, leaned a little bit to the right. Surprise. But between 58 and 70, there was a dramatic shift to the left, much more so. And I mean, it is almost a straight line and showed no signs of changing. And informally, I looked at some contemporary editorials the same way from some of those major papers and found them up there. And so we see this shift during that time in the 60s to a much more uh, liberal orientation. Additionally, the way the editorials were crafted changed, which I think reflects a change in the, the news culture and the culture of the country. In the late 50s, we found even if they leaned one way or supported one policy, they still offered a healthy clash of those issues. And so you, you kind of got both sides and you had room to disagree. As we progress further to 1970, that stops and it becomes more polemic and less an argument. I think one of the main considerations for that change was the Cultural Revolution. We start to see a new generation coming into power. And we now have the creation of a liberal environment. And let's not forget some of the formative documents that came out of Students for Democratic Society in the early 60s. And they quite clearly stated that student progressives needed to move into the major institutions of this country to affect change. We're going to be on the streets and in every institution of this country from now on. The media, the news media, was one of those institutions that was targeted. We're going to replace capitalism with socialism. There was also some dissatisfaction with the federal government in terms of its forthrightness with what was going on in Vietnam. As uh, trust was lost, there was more willingness to oppose. So it was, it was many factors engaging, and now it's gone all the way now. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry 
of vast proportions. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizen can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals. And so it is to the printing press, to the recorder of man's deeds, that we look for strength and assistance, confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent. I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators. <laughs> took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. Babies pulled from incubators and scattered like firewood across the floor. And they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. That was horrifying. This uh, war may, may be beginning right now. Two hours ago, Allied Air Forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. The inevitable has happened. A woman testified before Congress that Iraqi soldiers had gone into the nursery of a Kuwaiti hospital, and they were taking babies and lifting them out of the incubators and throwing them onto the ground, smashing them. This is a horrific visual, and public sentiment was against the first war in Iraq until that very important testimony was spread far and wide. Well, as it turns out, she was actually the daughter of one of the crown princes of Kuwait. It was a completely fabricated story that had been orchestrated by a major PR firm. They had spent millions of dollars on it, and it was completely fake. But the media would incredulously spread that. They give amplification to a message that they like. And then if that message turns out to be false, they say, well, all we do is report the news. No, you chose to report that, though. You chose to amplify that. You chose to splice that clip and air it nonstop. Fool me once. Shame on me. Shame on you. Every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. You fool me, we can't get fooled again. So the second war in Iraq was also based on a lie promulgated by the New York Times. Iraq has made several attempts to buy high-strength aluminum tubes used to enrich uranium for a nuclear weapon. The kinds of tubes that are necessary to build a centrifuge. First of all, the New York Times was not alone. Almost every paper in the country right. was reporting this and network. There was a consensus. I think what I did wrong was I wasn't permitted by my paper to go back and look at those stories when we had more information. One person might say, Cernovich, you're wrong. All the media did was report on information given to them by the government. And I would say, well, that's fascinating. You must think that I don't have a very good memory because when I read Twitter today and I read a paper today, they say, you can't trust Trump. He's such a liar. You can't trust the government. Our job as journalists is to fight against the government. I see that every day. But if there's a war, we just accept everything is true. And it is our duty as loyal Americans to shut up once the fighting begins. We entered the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War. My fellow Americans. The Gulf of Tonkin incident was the basis for the war in Vietnam, which cost between 50 and 75,000 American lives. Many people's lives were ruined, mental illnesses, PTSD. Well, that was another lie. So let's look at it. we got three big wars in America. You see a lot of lies. So where is the soul searching by these large mainstream outlets? I would like to see that. 
If you look at the mainstream media, they are in lockstep with either the Pentagon or the State Department or officials that clearly do have an agenda. It's a self-sustaining relationship. Any empire, any corporation, any person knows that the only thing that could ever take them down is the truth. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to a major circulation American journal. We do have people who submit pieces to other to American journals. Fake corporate news media is nothing new. It's just more finance today, a lot bigger, a lot slicker. Back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, there was Project Mockingbird that Senator Frank Church's committee exposed where the CIA and other agencies had key people throughout positions in the mainstream media to put out fake news or to kill stories when they needed it done. They infiltrated high-ranking media organizations all around the United States and were working not only with them, but reporting as if they were neutral journalists when they were pushing an agenda. A planted story is intended to serve a national purpose abroad. Um, came home and were circulated here and believed here. Operation Mockingbird should make everyone think twice about the news and information and where it comes from and how it could be weaponized against you, which I think is happening right now at a very severe level. And now we have Jeff Bezos, one of the richest men in the world, close to $100 billion in wealth with his oligopoly Amazon getting $600 million contract from the CIA to house their servers while he uses the Washington Post that he owns as a warfare machine against President Trump and the American people. I was supported by the Central Intelligence Agency, by the CIA. This one great German journalist came out and said, yeah, the CIA wrote headlines for me. They told me what to say. There's many countries where this happens, where you well, where you find people to, um, to claim they are respected journalists, but if you look behind them, you'll find uh, they are puppets on a string of the Central Intelligence Agency. Obama signed a Ministry of Truth into action before he left to use U.S. intelligence agencies against the American people. Now, critics argue the act allows the U.S. government to censor some news as propaganda and push a government agenda, in other words, government propaganda, on the U.S. citizens, usually by way of labeling inconvenient stories as fake news. Propaganda is now legal, yes, legal, not illegal. It used to be illegal, according to a 1948 law, Smith Month Act, something like that. Because three years ago, wrapped inside the 2013 NDAA, was an amendment that removed the ban on the U.S. government creating propaganda and then showing it to U.S. citizens. A lot of people who claim that they're journalists, they're just repeaters. They get a press release and they just rewrite the press release. I was actually able to uncover something that, that really, uh, you know, made me feel defrauded as a journalist, not only our sources. We found out that Bahrain is a paying customer at CNN. They've also uh, produced similar content for Georgia, Kazakhstan, and other nations as well, Lebanon. Look, if CNN's corporate bosses want to worship dictatorships, that's their right. But when they're getting paid by the dictatorships to do it, in my view, that's criminal and it's downright anti-American. I was accused of leaking state sec leaking secrets of states six times house searched. Uh, well, they, they, they hoped that I wouldn't do that ever again. I don't mind what will happen. I've had three heart attacks. I have no children. So if they want to bring me to court or to prison, so it's worse for the truth. The truth won't die. Decades ago, it used to be the case that news divisions did their investigative reporting operating at a loss. They did so in the public interest. That, that's gone by the wayside. These days, news organizations do specifically what's, what behooves their bottom line. Hi, uh, my, my name is James O'Keefe. I'm from Project Veritas. And Project Veritas started uh, with the mission of investigating and exposing waste, fraud, abuse, corruption, dishonesty, self-dealing in order to make a more ethical and transparent society. In order to do that, 
we have to go undercover because a lot of these people are not going to tell us on the record what's happening. One story has monopolized President Trump's time in office like no other, especially on CNN. Russia. In fact, since the inauguration, CNN has mentioned Russia on their air nearly 16,000 times. So we sent our undercover reporters inside CNN to understand why. Then why is CNN constantly like, Russia this, Russia that? Because it's ratings. If it's all just because of ratings, if it's all just for money, if, if his own staff, more than one person, thinks that it's BS. Well, the Russian thing is that the big nothing burger. Really? Yeah. It's mostly bullshit right now. Like, we don't have any big giant proof. And they're doing it in order to make money only? All the nice, cutesy little ethics that used to get talked about in journalism school, you're just like, that's adorable. <laughs> that's adorable. <laughs> yeah, this is that's something the American people need to see. I'm not making a value judgment about it, but that's information that people need to see. And that's the real, the heart of the matter is journalism is about exposing things for what they really are. And there's a lot of powerful interests that do not want things exposed for how they actually are. People go in the media, journalists, would-be journalists would say, Cernovich, you just want clicks. All you care about is page views. These are the people who live and die by ratings. These are the people who, the minute the show's over, they're waiting for the ratings to be uploaded. If there's a way to start a war and get America involved in another major massive war, all the media companies stand to make a lot of money. Nobody talks about that. For example, when there was a major terrorist attack in France, the images of dead babies were blurred, and we were told by the media, never show, never show dead children on television. This is too horrific. This is not what we're about. You can't do it. This is what we're told, right? But then suddenly we have a story about Assad gassing his own people and a lot of people want war in Syria. Well, not only do they accept the conclusion that Assad gassed his own people without any real evidence, but now they post images of dead babies on television and in the newspapers and post those pictures. Tonight I ordered a targeted military strike the president again citing the disturbing video of Tuesday's horrific chemical attack as a major influence on his decision. A dizzying turnaround for an administration that just days ago declared that their priority was not to oust Syrian President Bashar al-Assad from power. Donald Trump became president of the United States. I think this was actually a big moment. The media makes a massive amount of money with wars because then you have nonstop coverage embedded journalists, hot new footage, watch this latest bombing drop, watch this latest firefight. We see these beautiful pictures at night from the decks of these two U.S. Navy vessels in the Eastern Mediterranean. I am tempted to quote the great Leonard Cohen. I'm guided by the beauty of our weapons, and they are beautiful pictures. They make a ton of money doing that. Not only that, but their parent corporations and these media holding companies and their shareholders make a ton of money off of war. Boeing makes a ton of money. These contractors make a ton of money. The lobbyists make a ton of money because now you have contracts to dole out. Nobody talks about this, though. How does the media make its money? War is not, never coming from itself. There is always people behind it to push for war. And this is not only politicians, this is journalists, too. Because, you know, there's a lot of jobs at stake. Certainly, uh, if uh, a lot of these defense contractors stop selling uh, warplanes, other sophisticated equipment, there's going to be a, a, a significant loss of jobs. So what they're doing is completely dishonest. This is beyond a hoax. This is a giant, organized fraud. The news is not the news. The news is propaganda. Nothing has captured this crisis like the picture that we began with last night. His family says his name was Island and that he and his brother and his mother drowned trying to reach Greece by boat. All photographs are rhetoric. All photographs are accurate. None of them are the truth. Let's face it, we don't see the world in a still frame. We don't see the world in black and white. We don't see the world frozen. All photographs are kind of self-portraits. They're, they're really a reflection of the photographer and uh, the editor 
There's a lot of journalists who get angry uh, when I say that. And tonight, we're going to spend the program looking at the power of that image, which has shocked the world, shaken politicians, and transformed the debate about refugees fleeing from war. If you're listening to a song, uh, you have to listen to the song. You have to at least get to the hook before you decide that you think it's a good song. Still images don't work that way. Still images happen immediately. I just can't look at that without being so upset. Like, it just makes me think how lucky, lucky I am that I live in Australia, that my children live in Australia. That's what it is. Yeah. The most persuasive thing is visual. Our visual sense overpowers everything else. So what they choose to show as an image is the message, no matter what the, you know, the words on the screen say. What you remember is what you saw. The salaciousness or the a shock value of images uh, can be used in order to kind of manipulate people's behavior. Dead children are normally taboo, especially on the front page. But next morning, almost every UK newspaper broke the rule and ran an image on the front cover. And if you compare that to the bodies in Europe from terrorist attacks, some of which committed by these migrants or their descendants, those bodies you can't see. Showing those bodies can get you censored on social media. People still have fears, fears that migrants might have an ISIS member lurking among them, which there has been no credible example of. The news broke that one of the attackers may have posed as a refugee and entered Europe through Greece with a fake Syrian passport. Knowing that you're not seeing those photographs should be a tip, right? It should be a clue. So I, I'd always sensed that the news, there was a lot of fake news. I'd always sensed it, but I, I lived it and I was completely behind the scenes. What happened, what brought me into journalism is there was a big thing going on in Budapest, Hungary with migrants. The media was saying the Hungarian people are just beating up these migrants and they're abusing them. This is so terrible. So I happened to be over in Budapest so I just said I was gonna be in Hungary through my blog. And I started getting emails from people. I see you're gonna be in Hungary, I actually live here. And then I decided to have a meetup through my blog because they said, oh yeah, the media's like totally lying about this. We'll show you what's really going on. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. I don't have blog readers. I don't have book readers. I have a human intelligence network. And then I thought about like Fight Club. They said, we're the ones serving your food. We're the ones watching your car, where the parking lot attendants, where the, the baristas, and I, and I kind of had that moment where I go, yeah, I, I don't have readers, I now have sources. Do not follow this. So I went to Hungary and I reported on the, the refugee hoax that was going on. They, they were actually being very well taken care of. There was charity everywhere you looked. Everybody there is very well fed multiple meals, cleaning areas, tent cities everywhere. The men are playing soccer, people are goofing off. Completely different than what was being reported. There was one woman in a wheelchair. So you know what? All the media people lined up to talk to the one woman in the wheelchair. No cameras on anything else happening there. So as I'm there witnessing it, then I would read the New York Times and you see an image of a child or a person in a wheelchair or something. No, there were like 10, 15 kids there. The rest of them were men of prime fighting age. What happened for me personally at the Coletti train station is I'd never had something go viral. I uploaded pictures on Facebook and I got over a million people reach on Facebook. And I go, wow, okay, I'm, I'm onto something. And then I, then I started to say, well, I'm gonna take people behind the news. I'm gonna put the camera on the media. He could have undermined the messaging so much that he can actually control right. uh, exactly what people think. And that is, the, that is our you... job. The old guard is gone, the new guard is here. Journalism on the web, and created specifically for the web, is disrupting traditional models and creating new ones. You're credited with pretty much digitally revolutionizing this whole new media movement. My name is Tim Poole. I'm a journalist and technologist. I cover conflict and crisis stories all over the world. I was in Egypt during the revolution. I was in Ukraine at the start of the Civil War. I was in the Venezuelan student uprising a few years ago, among many other stories. I think the new media is finding faster, better, and more efficient ways to cover the story than old media ever can. When I go out on the ground and report, I have a GoPro that's about this big, 
and my phone. And I can strap the phone to my chest, which does a high definition live broadcast. I can interact with my audience. And then I look over to my side and I see a big satellite truck that costs 10 times, 100 times as much as my cell phone plan. TV 31 wants you to meet our newest edition. I'm filming two things at once. I'm reporting, I'm filming, I'm interacting with the audience. I'm also filming a separate segment. The jobs of four people in one person. And they still can't get the speed and content that I can. Yeah, I, I took that mindset of going behind the scenes to Trump events. Not to the rallies, which I found quite boring, but to what was happening outside. And it was carnage. People had taken over the streets with tearing down signs, sucker punching people, screaming at people. It was pandemonium, and I just live streamed. I didn't know what was going on. I just live streamed the whole thing. And my phone went dead. Because at the time, I didn't know to have a battery pack. You're like a rookie, right? So I'm running, running to charge my battery, get like three, four, five percent, sprint back, you know, live streaming, sprinting back, live streaming. And it was fun. It was a major adrenaline rush. The biggest difference between an independent journalist and a mainstream reporter, first, is the entrepreneurial attitude. It's a huge risk to go off on your own. And so immediately, there's going to be a different perspective on the world. A lot of the traditional journalists, they get out of school, they look for a job. A lot of independent journalists know what they want to do and oftentimes will fly themselves to some dangerous part of the world because they want the story. Yeah, but we live for this, you know? We live to tell the truth. Nobody else is going to do it. We have to do it. So here's another great example of fake news. If you watch the news of the RNC, you would be told total chaos, division, Oh, there's protests everywhere. Protests everywhere at the RNC. You'd go to these protests, there's 20 people. I kid you not. 20 people and 100 media people taking pictures and they would stage them and they would crop the shot so you couldn't really tell how many people were there. So disappointed by these protests. Yeah, I know, I'm gonna have to go to DNC. So I go and I was in a real protest march. Burn that fucking white cap we shit the fuck down. Oh, oh shit! Oh shit, don't go away! Do not if you turn on the news, you're not seeing this. Day one of the DNC, I'm out there periscoping, live streaming videos. There are 5,000 people at least at FDR Park across from the DNC. All right, 360. Right? That's, that's everywhere, okay? Everywhere. You know how many mainstream journalists I saw there? Zero. There's not even one journalist here, except for me. They're all on Twitter, talking about, you know, the future of the, the Democratic Party and the future of the election. They're unbelievably lazy. You know, being a, a right winger in New York City, I'm drowned in the, uh, in the opposition. And you learn to enjoy conflict, you learn to enjoy arguing, and I think it makes you a more complete person. And we wonder why the media has become. These people don't leave their desks. And this is true of the right and the left. They'll sit there and they'll Google and they'll talk about a backlash and you'll go check the evidence of this backlash and you realize it's just tweets. There's no more Watergate from the beat reporter talking to people on the street because he just uses Google. These kids now are turning to themselves for information. They're their own journalists. And that's what's so exciting about this time, is someone like James O'Keefe can come along with an undercover camera and totally blow up the New York Times, fake voting, all of this stuff by going out there and just doing it themselves. So, th so the biggest rub on me is that I'm not a journalist. That's what they will say. James O'Keefe is not a journalist. Whatever, whatever they want to call us, it doesn't matter. What matters is the thing that you are producing. I'd like to get a comment as soon as possible. Okay. Is that name? James O'Keefe. Okay. Yeah, thanks. This is the oh shit moment. Journalism is not just an identity, it's an activity. It is, a, it is what you do, and you judge people based on what they produce. Basically, everyone is a journalist. But here you have actual grassroots activism, and there's no media. So you go to the DNC, 
you see this massive protest, real protest, not like this bullshit, the RNC, which the media hyped up. Real protesters, and they're Democrats, and they're being kept out by this big cage. It's like, we're the criminals, but not her. And they're all talking about how they hate Hillary, they're not going to vote for, they're not going to do anything for Hillary Clinton, because they thought the primary was rigged. And there's no mainstream coverage of this at all. They're chanting WikiLeaks. What do you think about the WikiLeaks? Okay. Uh, yeah. That's just, that's the last straw. That is the proof of what we've all expected that they've been doing. The WikiLeaks released thousands of emails from the DNC appearing to show favoritism towards Hillary Clinton. CNN can't verify the authenticity of those emails, but they suggest that Bernie Sanders may have been right. The primary system was rigged against him. WikiLeaks offered a window into the world that most people would have never had. And that's the real reason that the media lied about WikiLeaks. When Chris Cuomo said on CNN, It's illegal to possess uh, these stolen documents. It's different for the media. So everything you learn about this, you're learning from us. It's different for the media. It's different for the media. WikiLeaks showed, though, the extent of the collusion. There were, I believe, 52 reporters who had had various off-the-record, very homey dinners with John Podesta. So they're all great friends. Glenn Thrush, who was then at Politico and now at the New York Times, emailed John Podesta and said, I'm such a hack that I'm going to send you the part of the article that pertains to you before it's released. What they were doing is they're giving the other side a head start. Hey, we're about to drop this hit piece on you tomorrow. Get your talking points locked and loaded tonight. It's amazingly valuable. Not only did he not get punished, but he is now the White House correspondent at the New York Times. Maggie Haberman, who I also believe is at Politico, was referred to as a friendly reporter that the Clinton campaign would use to tee up stories. Maggie Haberman now works at the New York Times. I have an uphill climb, and I'm going to climb as high and hard as I can. Donna Brazil was a CNN contributor, and she obtained some questions from the town hall, which was competitive between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, and she gave the questions to Hillary Clinton. She confirmed that the primary was rigged against Bernie, and it was rigged for Hillary. She revealed that based on the fundraising agreement between Hillary Clinton's campaign and between the DNC, that all the messaging from the DNC had to be cleared by what she called Brooklyn. That was the, the Hillary Clinton office. Every press release had to be pre-approved. Well, that's a nice advantage. I would like every article about me to have to be pre-approved by me. That would be amazing. WikiLeaks confirmed what people already knew but couldn't prove, which is that the media and the Democrats are one and the same. There is no difference. They're all buddy-buddy. And whatever you read in the mainstream news is going to be the Democrat talking points. One of the things I don't think you need to convince anybody anymore is that the media is biased. Um, I think there used to be a day, you know, maybe when I was a kid, when people said, well, the news is at least trying not to be biased. <laughs> They're at least trying. Um, but now nobody believes that. What they do believe, which is weirder and maybe worse, is that they believe that only the other side is biased. Um, and that's a tough one to crack. You know, a lot of people will look at me and they'll say, Lauren, you've obviously got a bias. Yeah, everyone has a bias. I'm just honest about it. I will tell you, yeah, I'm coming from a right wing point of view. That's my my feelings inside, I am right wing. So I'm gonna explain that to you and tell you to go look and read other journalism as well. It doesn't matter if you are one political side or the other, it matters, are you gonna tell the truth about what happened? And so with, with a lot of these journalists, they're more interested in winning, they're more interested in the political agenda, they're more interested in fitting in than being honest. If I was the CEO of the New York Times, I would say, I would bring all my reporters in the room and say, here's the deal. If you, you know, if you have an if you have an opinion and it gets injected into your article, then then state that to the public. The issue with the mainstream media is they tell you, I'm neutral. I'm coming from a position that's totally impartial. President Obama is the most noble man who has ever lived in the White House. The Manchurian candidate couldn't destroy us faster than Barack Obama. It's illegal to possess. Ah, uh, these stolen documents. The most trusted name in news. It's ridiculous. You have media that's literally colluding during the debates that are leaking questions and still pretending to be impartial media. Everyone has a bias. It's just some people are going to be honest about it and some people aren't. And new media, independent media, are honest about it. What I learned at the DNC, not only about the media being fake and how they would construct a fake narrative in real time, 
But I, I did see how the, the Democrats and the media were covering up the whole Bernie, Bernie Sanders thing. And I said, there's no way in the world Hillary Clinton's going to win. So people, of course, call me all year. You're an idiot. You're a conspiracy theorist. You don't know anything. You're not an expert. Blah. And I was like, well, that's because you're watching the news. Could he actually win? No freaking way! <laughs> and which Republican candidate <clears throat> has the best chance of winning the general election? Of the declared ones right now, Donald Trump. We have Hillary's about a 75 or an 80 percent favorite. We have different versions yeah, of the high. forecast. 89 percent for Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton has a 100 percent chance of winning. The, the presidential race is over. The state of the race at the presidential level is virtually over. Oklahoma, Tennessee, Mississippi, South Carolina. Pretty dramatic change in your forecast. They we're in a weird, weird situation right now. Oh. And CNN projects Donald Trump will carry the state of Florida. Ohio will go to Donald Trump. Donald Trump has won the state of Pennsylvania. That is uh, the race. Donald Trump wins the presidency. Well, America is crying tonight. Everybody is crying. How do we explain how this is possible? How did this happen? Since Election Day, questions have been raised about the role that false news stories distributed online played in the final result. There's been a lot of talk lately about fake news. Fake news. Fake news. Hoax sites and hyperpartisan blogs that are spread further on social media platforms. As long as on social media, people start believing it. Real world political implications. Real world consequences. A threat to democracy. Journalists are overplaying the fake news stories to demonize people you don't agree with. In this last election, the nation was assaulted by imposters masquerading as reporters. Michael Cernovich, a Southern California lawyer, has become a magnet for readers with a taste for stories with no basis in fact. Yeah, 60 Minutes wanted to do an interview with me because they were doing a big segment on fake news and they wanted to make me out to be fake news. Uh, it was a complete setup, God bless them. Cernovich's website is just one of hundreds publishing nonsense on the right and on the left. So intelligent people who are familiar with my body of work understand what I do and why I do it. And it's very meta. The first thing that Machiavelli would tell a prince to do would be to write a book denouncing the prince. And so I think it's interesting, you know, to have someone like Mike doing a documentary about fake news because it's owning a term that has been directed at him and people like him. These news stories are fakes. They're definitely not fake. They're lies. They're not lie at all. One of the reasons that someone like Mike, I think, aggravates journalists so much is that he's sort of like a, like a carnival mirror. Hillary Clinton has Parkinson's disease, physician confirms. You don't think that's misleading? No. He's projecting back at them what they do in almost all their, but to, a, to an absurd and almost uh, offensive level. Hillary is a zombie. What do you guys think? You want to do a hashtag? What do you think of zombie Hillary? And, and what, so what I am doing is I am being a funhouse mirror where you think that we're the monsters, but really all we're doing is changing the wording on things that you'd actually say. Hillary, all I know is that she is sick. This is a very sick man. He is truly very sick. This is why we need Hillary's medical records. How recently has he had a colonoscopy or other cancer tests? John McCain's health was a big issue. The media was all covering it. Is John McCain healthy? Everybody's been talking about Donald Trump's health. Is this president of sound mind? Whether it's a personality disorder, a borderline personality. He's not in control of himself. Some people have said he had mental health problems. The New Republic said Donald Trump had syphilis. The dangerous case of Donald Trump, 27 psychiatrists and mental health experts assess a president. So if you're a bunch of psychologists and you want to write a book about a patient you've never seen, the media will cover it and you'll be a bestseller. The book includes and validates some of the general news media's speculation about Donald Trump's mental capacity. With Hillary's health, I had a doctor who had never seen her, and they remind me of that, well, he never treated her. That story was sourced to an anesthesiologist who never met Clinton. What is your take of, of all the doctors and clinicians all across the country who have said that in this <clears throat> president, they see symptoms of this, that, and the other? The duty to warn outweighs that con the, the consideration that would normally apply, which is I'm not gonna offer a public diagnosis of a person I have not met. 
But when it's a Democrat, there's now a, a new higher evidentiary standard and we can't just talk about speculation and gossip. The conspiracy du jour, Hillary Clinton is harboring a secret medical condition. The president of the United States genuinely appears to be losing his grip on reality. And, and that would be the funhouse aspect is get real. They did it to McCain, they did it to Trump, we did it to Hillary, they're just gonna have to get over that. It's the, it's the exact same playbook that these other journalists are doing, and I think that sort of mimicry is, is very uh, upsetting. Which ties into the Scott Adams do your own two movies. If you're Scott Pelley, you're watching a movie where anybody who claims that Hillary Clinton had Parkinson's is a complete and total conspiracy theorist. If you're anybody else in America, you're watching a movie where you see a very sick person having coughing fits, having so-called allergies, falling down multiple times, and then having a major seizure on 9-11, and you're thinking, they're calling Cernovich out for the Hillary's health thing? She had a seizure and froze up, walking into her motorcade. Well, she had pneumonia. I mean... How do you know? Who told you that? Well, the campaign told us that. Why would you trust the campaign? The point is... The camera didn't show that, but he actually dropped his glasses. He was so freaked out because they're not used to somebody coming after them. The whole power dynamic of I'm the media and I'm Scott Pelley and I'm 60 Minutes and we're just going to interrogate you and you're going to give us what you want, that isn't even in my mind. I'm thinking, how is this going to look when I edit that clip and make memes and make viral videos? Disingenuous uh, sort of online posturing. Um, it might feel harmless. This might feel no different than creating, you know, lolcat memes. But these memes have real consequences in the real world for real people. This idea of fake news is sort of a misnomer um, because fake news creates real opinions, which creates real actions. Um, and then we live with the real consequences of that, right? No amount of reporting makes Pizzagate real. Uh, but the bullet that goes through that pizza shop is very real and could have killed someone. Pizzagate actually comes from the WikiLeaks release of hacked emails from Clinton campaign chairman John Podesta. And it was from those emails that the claims that John Podesta may be part of a child sex trafficking ring come from. Whenever the media talks about Pizzagate, don't just look at what they bring up, look at what they don't bring up. The, the Pizzagate, as it's now called conspiracy theory, actually originated in a Podesta email that's quite weird and to this day is perplexing, where somebody told John Podesta, you left a handkerchief on the counter. There's a map on there, something pizza related. Who cares, a handkerchief? Throw, throw a handkerchief away. You're gonna FedEx somebody a handkerchief that's so bizarre. And then who writes a map on a handkerchief? And then the map is something pizza related? That's bizarre. That's code word for something. Could be codes for drugs. I don't know, but why don't, nobody in the media ever said, hey dude, why would you have a handkerchief with a map on it that's pizza related? And why would anybody think it's important enough to send to you? Users of the anonymous online message board 4chan, known for rogue political discussion, suggested without any proof whatsoever that the word pizza was code for child sex trafficking at the restaurant. The conspiracy theory quickly spread to Reddit and YouTube, feeding fake online news stories, then jumping to Facebook and Twitter. People on 4chan and 8chan, they just post and they say, guys, like, look at this, what the hell is this? And then they just start connecting the dots and it's all public record. It's, it's all out there in the public domain. And all they're doing is connecting the dots that the media, you know, wouldn't touch. And the media wants you to believe that you can't look at this stuff and say, yeah, this is really weird. This is really fucking weird. The amazing thing about Pizzagate is that if you start looking into the, the evidence for it, it's really compelling, meaning that it's hard to imagine that all of that evidence doesn't mean what the Pizzagate conspiracy <laughs> thought it meant, right? But it's also classic confirmation bias. Yeah, there's another piece of evidence from my side. Yeah, there's another one. Even though other people could look at it and just say, what the hell are you talking about? You know, I don't see it. The Pizzagate narrative, as least as concerning Mr. Oliphanus at Comet Ping Pong, we have subsequently determined was based upon what we now believe was an incorrect narrative. We apologize. To the extent our commentaries could be considered as negative statements about Mr. Oliphanus or Comet Ping Pong, we encourage you to hold us accountable because we improve 
when you do. These, they call themselves Pizzagate researchers, which I never was. They have video after video analyzing everything. And somehow it became about a pizza parlor. Uh, the Comet Pizza shooting, by the way, is a very sad thing. And the shooter had no connection to me and never read my stuff. The fake news media has claimed that I propagated it and spread it and everything. But they can never find me blaming that pizza parlor for anything. They can never find me blaming the owner of that pizza parlor for anything. But I was always focused on things that were real and that were bizarre. You tweeted, the Clintons were running a pedophilia ring. It's been in the emails all the time. We just weren't able to see the code. Yeah, I don't agree with that. You don't agree with that? I definitely don't think the Clintons are personally running a pedophilia So why did you write it? That was worded imprecisely. It was more that why they- Why did you write it then? You can go back to 2004, where there was a puff piece written about Tony Podesta. Washington Post and The Guardian had both written pieces about what a great avant-garde art collector he is. And they say, oh, it's just art, it's just modern art. Like, it's just art, don't worry about it. It's kind of like, that's kind of a cop-out. If it's art or not, it's screwed up. For the vast majority of Americans, they're gonna look into that and say, that, that's weird stuff. Now, maybe Cernovich overplays it. You know, maybe he sensationalizes a little bit. But the sentiment of it is, these are very creepy people. There's an email from the WikiLeaks where the Podestas talk about having stayed in touch with Dennis Hastert. Dennis Hastert was a longtime family friend. Dennis Hastert went to prison for money laundering offenses related to paying off his pedophile victims, people that he had victimized when they were young, underage. Why are you still friends with Dennis Hastert? He is, he is a pedophile. He did go to prison. The media didn't want to ask those questions. And in a way, that's probably why P Pizzagate probably got out of control because the media actually refused to ask the questions. The shooting incident shows how a fake news story can lead to a real life-threatening situation. Devastating consequences. Real world consequences. I mean, it seemed to me as if the media had been given its marching orders. Fake news, they insisted, was an imminent threat to American democracy. A threat to democracy. The dangers to democracy are obvious. Who invented the phrase fake news in its modern context? Who wanted to control the information we were receiving on the internet and on the news and why? Fake news is a phrase. I had never, ever, ever heard in my life, and I don't think any American had heard in their lives until a month after the election. And if you look at, you can go on Google Trends or something, and you can type in fake news, and you can see a chart for how many times that phrase was mentioned on the internet. And the chart is, you know, zero mentions, ever. And then all at once, it skyrockets. On September 13th, 2016, a nonprofit called First Draft announced a partnership to tackle malicious hoaxes and fake news reports. If you follow the money, you often get a lot of answers to questions. So I want to know who is behind the funding for that nonprofit First Draft and its anti fake news campaign. It turns out the funding came from Google. Google's parent company, Alphabet, was headed at the time by a man named Eric Schmidt, who happens to have devoted himself to Hillary Clinton's election campaign, offered himself up as a strategist to her campaign, and is listed as her number one campaign donor through his company, Alphabet. So his company funded this nonprofit first draft around the start of the election cycle. Like, why is that the case? Because Google is a search engine. It's a tech company. What's Google doing, doing palling around with Hillary Clinton and the State Department and the government and all these deep state people? was the whole anti-fake news campaign an attempt to shape our views and limit our access to certain information by labeling selected websites and stories as fake and controversializing them. And it's totally a psyop. It's totally a psyop. As soon as the fake news meme, you know, got going, Facebook started labeling certain news stories from alternative media outlets fake news. And so, you know, if they can't, if they can't ban the First Amendment uh, straight out right away, they go for plan B, which is to discredit anybody that isn't themselves and to get them banned semi-legally with stuff like Facebook, which is basically a monopoly at this point. You know, there, there are no real competitors to Facebook in this country or Twitter or Google. If you, if, if you get kicked off these big Silicon Valley platforms, you're basically fucked. Facebook and other social media sites are being criticized for not doing enough to stop bogus stories. This week, social media giants Facebook and Google said they will go after hoax websites by restricting ad revenue. Almost 100% of our videos are demonetized as a punishment for what we are politically doing.
So simultaneously, the corporate media demonizes us for direct selling products so we can fund our operation. While Google had us banned off Google ads, and while they have demonetized us 95% for our political views. So they want me to just go to the gulag, shut up, go bankrupt, shut down, and stop having my speech, and I'm not gonna do it. I think the end game in America is European style hate speech laws. A lot of people in America don't know this, but in Germany, in Sweden, in the UK, and in France, you've had ordinary people go to prison for making anti-immigration or anti-Islam uh, posts on Facebook. Sweden should be a canary in the coal mine for, for the rest of us. Uh, the police have just warned us that if, if we don't leave now and, and take this escort, it's gonna get really bad really fast. They said 50 people could be here in minutes and they recognize us, they're masking up, we have to leave. And when I go to Stockholm and actually get escorted out by the police, the media in Sweden claimed I wasn't escorted out by the police. Well, no. I. I have, a, I have GoPro footage as I was walking out. I took my gimbal and started filming the police behind me. Yet the mainstream media, the Swedish media, reported the police perspective that I was wrong and I was lying. And then immediately started attacking me. I started getting phone calls. My phone would not stop ringing. They started sharing my phone number with each other. I kid you not. And so I actually went on a, a national television program. So welcome to Opinion Live. They had scheduled me on this program before I went to Rinkeby. But when I went on, they asked me to explain what happened in Rinkeby. They first said that the police had disputed my claims that I was escorted out and asked me to, to clarify, to which I responded basically how, like how I, how I just did. And she responded in Swedish, instead of saying what I said, she said, he's talking about Rinkeby, but the police have disputed what he is saying and said that he's lying. They didn't even tell the audience what I said. They just said I was a liar. I've, I've talked with people who have visited Sweden on vacation, and you know what they tell me? They tell me it's the North Korea of the North. One of the largest newspapers, Expressen, hacked a comment system to find anonymous posters. They find their names and addresses. They go to the homes of private individuals, film their faces, and accuse them of being white supremacists. Sure enough, these people lose their jobs. They lose all their friends. People are scared to interact with them. Many people it's not so much about being scared to interact with them because they don't like their opinions. It's because they'll also get blacklisted. They're gonna come after you and they're gonna try and whip up a hate mob and get you fired from your job, ostracized from, from your community. They're gonna smear you. They're gonna call you a neo-Nazi white supremacist. They're gonna call you a conspiracy theorist. They're gonna call you a Russian agent. They're gonna do everything they can to shut you down. And in the face of this unprecedented censorship, we've only seen support grow. That's why they lie worse than ever. That's why they're so hysterical. It's why they're so angry, so hateful. Then along came Donald Trump, the wild card. Probably the only politician that could have or would have been able to change this dynamic and kind of turn the campaign on its head. Each time advocates cried fake news, Donald Trump called them fake news. We were able to turn fake news back on them almost instantly. Of course, with the help of President Dr. Donald J. Trump, PhD, which is what I call him now, because he started calling the mainstream media fake news. Since you are attacking no, our news not organization, you, not can you. you give us a chance? Your organization you're, you're is attacking Don't be rude. Like, can you give us a question? Don't be you're rude. attacking us. Can you give us a question? Don't be rude. Can you no, give I'm us not a question? Give you a can I'm you, not going to give you a can question. You can you stay categorical? You are fake news. The news is fake. Fake media. The failing New York Times. Fake news. Very mm -hmm. fake news. Mm -hmm. They should be ashamed of themselves. Watch out, Trump. Donald Trump is... You know, I've been hearing more and more about a thing called fake news. But I will tell you, some of the media outlets that I deal with are fake news. And so as soon as they introduced the idea that news could be fake, it was turned against them almost immediately. The rate just exploded! The official presidential tweet is an old wrestling video takedown with businessman Trump, doctored with the CNN logo covering the face of his victim. When Trump posted the CNN uh, wrestling meme, it was absolutely hilarious. It was great. Memes are funny. You know, there's really no other way to put it. Memes are fucking hilarious. Anonymous internet memes are, for a lot of people, the only way to get exposed to, uh, to the truth. And the reason people are anonymous and why it's so powerful is because if, if you're not anonymous and you don't have a fuck you money, basically, the media is going to come after you like they came after the guy who posted the CNN wrestling meme that Donald Trump tweeted. 
did you just see this Trump thing, uh, the CNN thing? CNN tracked down the dude who posted the Trump wrestling video. They threatened to dox this kid. CNN said they wouldn't publish the guy's name because he had already apologized, and also because he promised he wouldn't do it again. But then CNN adds, they reserve the right to publish his identity wow. should any of that change. Apparently the guy posted some pretty bad stuff in the past, but come on CNN, you're starting to creep us out. I don't think they have a choice except to step it up because we're really in an existential battle for the meaning of free speech and for the meaning of truth. People have gotten a very, very skewed line of free speech today, a skewed definition. They think that free speech and hate speech are two different things which it's absolutely not. Hate speech is free speech. It's the ability to express yourself whether someone finds it hateful or not. My position is very simple. There are just three genders. Um, there's man, <laughs> woman, and retarded. You should be allowed to say the most offensive things on earth in free speech. This young man is retarded. America's first first man. One self-proclaimed internet troll, Milo Yiannopoulos, tells us he's unapologetic and proud, even after being banned from Twitter for his infamous online taunting of Ghostbusters star Leslie Jones. In the Twitter storm uh, sure, that happened, I was you called to... her a dude. I said, said, I said it's a good job there's a hot black dude in the movie. She's like, she looks like a man. I am entitled to say that I think a celebrity looks weird. I feel like things are going even more and more to each extreme. Milo was touring the country for a bit, and every place he went, there was period blood being thrown. There was girls screaming outside, smashing garbage cans on the ground. There were people trying to punch him on stage. And then uh, eventually, liberals just took it to a whole new extreme. And that was at Berkeley. I was due this evening to speak at UC Berkeley. I'm just sitting in a hotel room, stunned that hundreds of people were throwing rocks, um, throwing uh, goodness knows what else at the building, throwing fireworks at the police, because they're so threatened by the idea that a conservative speaker might be persuasive and interesting and funny. They just have to shut it down at all costs. I'm a gay Trump supporter. I wanted to go watch a gay Trump supporter. I think Milo is absolutely hilarious. We met up at a coffee shop across the street from Berkeley and I was just waiting for my friends to trickle in and it was just all these Antifa people were already there. So they're already kind of um, flirting with the idea of violence. So Antifa was a group that was started in the early 1900s in Germany, obviously as an anti-fascist group, but they were the violent militant wing of the Communist Party in Germany and as they uh, continued on they still have the same message, they're communists that believe in destroying anything they deem to be fascism through any means possible. They're screaming, hey fascist, hey Nazi. Uh, I forget the particular slogans that they're all chanting in unison, but, it's, but uh, the irony of it is because I was so naive, I kind of, I kind of thought that I, that, that I could connect with these people and say like, look, like I don't support those things either and they would just immediately understand and believe me. But you know, symbols are more powerful than words sometimes and you're wearing the wrong piece of clothing and it's just not going to do. I mean, props to them for the ones who are doing it non-violently, but I think that's a very rare thing indeed, so thank are you, you. Are you surprised, uh, ma'am? And then two minutes after that, bear-maced again, like beat with flagpoles. My friend got put in the hospital and that actually didn't air anywhere. That's wild. Never reported in the media. I've been wanting to have this conversation because this has been a big issue about free speech on campus and conservative voices being heard. But Mr. Reich, my first question to you is, there's a violence that we saw, this violence we saw at Berkeley, we had it live here on CNN last night. It ultimately does, it, it plays right into the hands of a right wing, white supremacist, someone like Milo Yiannopoulos. Like I told the newswoman over there that like specifically it was their narrative, they were a part of this, it was their narrative that was causing the violence on the left. This is not to remove personal responsibility from the actual people that do the violence, but they pretend to be objective. And that that's the part. And they implant these ideas in your head and they'll, they'll say things like, well, some people call these people white nationalists. Do they ask any of the people there? No. 
because that would actually be real journalism. The real problem is this name calling because, you know, as, as grateful as I am to be on the show and I like the attention, um, the real people that I want to hear from uh, are, the, you know, the guys who run CNN who are legitimizing ordinary conservatives being called white supremacists, anti-Semites, racists, sexists when they're not. There's an inevitable, obvious consequence. The things that had been said about Donald Trump led to extreme violence. In Donald Trump's America, everyone is speculating as to who should be the most afraid. Black people, Latinos. We grapple every day with what it means to have a president stained by racism. You fight Trump! You fight Trump! I'm just going to be honest. We think there might be a Nazi in the White House. He is a bigot. He is a racist. He is a misogynist. The president's crude and arguably racist remarks. The president has racist views. I'm a Bernie supporter. They might attack me. They, they thought I was a Trump supporter. I wasn't. Tens of millions of people voted for him after he showed his cards for years. But are you, so suggest we have are you suggesting that they're racist or they're... Absolute, yes. That is pure racism. And the president is cynically using that racism to appeal to his base. If everyone is a white supremacist, what does that even mean anymore? You know, you're just gonna accuse anyone who disagrees with you. I have people who tell me that I'm a Nazi sympathizer for being friends with Trump supporters, or that I'm a, a racist, and I'm actually a mixed race person, right? It's like nuance has gone out the window and none of it matters anymore. Say you worked in a loony bin, and there was this one guy going, the Khmer Rouge are coming, the Khmer Rouge are coming, Pol Pot is upstairs, the Khmer Rouge are gonna invade here, we gotta stop the communists in Cambodia. And you go, all right, Mr. McGillicuddy, that's okay, and you'd lead him to his room, and you go, he was a bitching about the Khmer Rouge again. That's the way the media is with Nazis. They see Nazis in their soup, they're everywhere. Now we have Nazi panic, where even if you're a girl, they'll hit you, it doesn't really matter. That's what the media does. There has been far more violence by Antifa against people they don't agree with, especially Trump supporters, than there has been violence by Trump supporters. But the media covers up violence by Antifa. I've reported from the White House several times, and on one visit, after the White House press briefing had concluded, I looked over at the assembled journalists and I said, Why will nobody here cover the violence against Trump supporters? <laughs> And why won't you demand that leaders of the Democrats disavow the violence from Antifa the way you demanded Trump disavow violence from his supporters? This is being completely covered up. They laughed at me. They thought that I would care, but their laughter actually proved what I wanted to prove. I wanted them to laugh at me because then I could show people, hey, this is what the media is all about. They laugh at violence against people if they don't like you. It's also not surprising that the right in, in a sense retaliated, came back out, held more events to counter this, this use of violence by an Antifa. We saw the rise of the base stick man. You know, there's a video of him cracking a stick over this Antifa member's head. And right then I'm like, Antifa is going to double down and they're gonna go nuts. And that's where we saw Antifa throwing explosives into the crowd. M80, M80! Somebody from the Antifa side just threw an M80 into the crowd. We heard a guy got stabbed in the chest. The bike lock basher, Eric Clanton, hit seven people over the head with a bike lock. If you were to ask me, I'd say that was an attempt to murder. I guess, you know, it's, it's, it's sadly predictable. That's, that's the scary thing, you know? And it looks like things are gonna escalate because nobody's gonna back down. And this is just the beginning. Just the beginning, dude. We're gonna go to every liberal stronghold Every city, fucking Portland, Detroit, all you cocksuckers in fucking Boston, watch out, we're coming for you. The area for rational discussion, as that disappears more, I think more people are going to be radicalized to both extremes and think violence is an acceptable way of protesting their distaste for other people's opinions. Imagine that your belief systems are essentially maps of the world that you use to orient yourself with. News informs you. If it's real news, it updates your map. It brings you into alignment better. There should be an alignment between you and the world if you're properly informed. You handed almost unlimited power to a fascist wannabe. So arrogant not... people, resentful people believe that deception works and it 
that's just not the case. When you act out of falsehood, then something terrible happens. That's the definition of a falsehood, fundamentally. You know, falsehoods have consequences. That's what makes them false. And you can not believe that, it's fine. You can even get away with it for some period of time. But you're not going to get away with it for very long. The latest developments in the shooting of a Republican congressman and others at a baseball practice outside of Washington. Congressman Steve Scalise has been shot. Apparently deliberately targeting the GOP. There was a shooting by a Bernie Sanders supporter and pro Antifa person at a congressional baseball practice called the Scalise shooting now. He cursed President Trump, labeled the president a traitor, and called for his destruction in several Facebook posts. And in the mainstream media, they acted like they really cared. Oh, they really cared. The shooter died from his injuries after the shootout with Capitol Police, news that we first were told by President Trump himself, who had uh, a somber and reflective message uh, for the nation. No, the people know. The people watched them laugh when they were asked about violence. They know that the media wants more shootings. Obviously, everybody is wishing the congressman well and hoping that he sure, recovers. Sure. Um, but Steve Scalise has a history that it's been, we've all been forced to sort of ignore um, on race. Um, he did come to leadership after some controversy over attending uh, a white nationalist event. They want people to get shot because they act as a propaganda arm for Antifa, which is a domestic terrorist group under investigation by the FBI. And they laugh at violence against people they don't agree with politically. The New York Times interviewed the suspect's brother, who says the 66-year-old was upset over the election of President Trump and went to Washington within the last few weeks to protest. Our axiomatic systems orient us in the world and regulate our emotions. Donald J. Trump is now President of the United States. President Obama. So when something axiomatically impossible happens, people are going to scramble to find reasons that don't require a retooling of their worldview. And it's, it's no wonder, because they're, they're avoiding, in archetypal terms, they're avoiding an involuntary descent to the underworld, and even to hell. That's also why people fight so hard to protect their, not only their belief systems, but their social systems. Often that means accusing someone else. Trump is a Nazi! Trump is a Nazi! Because then they have to change, not you. Trump's a racist! A worldview adjustment is a major revolution, and you may not recover from it. It just might do you in, may, or maybe you're chronically depressed. And so when you dig down and you have to restructure those axioms, not only do you have to encounter the unknown as such, which is no joke, but you may also have to discover your own malevolence. Well, it's no wonder people turn away from that. It's, it's not surprising at all, and everyone is like that. I mean, this is why I'm no fan of ideologies, generally speaking, because they place a mask of virtue over a dark set of, of motivations. And then you can tolerate looking at yourself in the mirror. Well, there's plenty of motivation to falsify, but it's, it's a bad idea. You live out the falsifications and, and uh, the world hits you. We begin with breaking news from Charlottesville, Virginia, where two people have been injured in an altercation with protesters who are out in force over the planned removal of a Confederate statue. Watch this. So my, my opinion of the race baiting that's going on and my opinion of the uh, portrayal of the social stripe and the neo-Nazis and et cetera is another example of a business model by the mainstream cable news networks and media to try to create an environment of discontent. What happened over the weekend in Charlottesville, Virginia was just disgusting. I was watching the news like everyone else. And you're seeing Nazi flags and torches and white supremacists. Hate no longer hides behind hoods. And I was sick to my stomach. And by the way, I have nothing but disdain for Nazis. This guy wearing a Hitler shirt. Yes, he is. I think the whole Charlottesville thing, I don't I think you have to have a zero tolerance policy on Nazis. But I think that there are a very, very small portion of the population. And if this was the 1960s, 70s, or 80s, objectively, they wouldn't be worthy enough of the news standing that they're getting right now. I think that the media 
will gin up controversy, take things and blow them out of proportion to gin up ratings. It glues people, it's addictive. Of course, everyone today is talking about the latest events that just unfolded in Charlottesville, Virginia. Today, we have a very special guest who is there on the ground. Basically, there was all of the Unite the Right type people in the area that they were sort of designated to be in. And police mostly had a hands-off approach. They had set up barricades uh, between that and then the outside protesters who were basically supposed to stay outside of the park. The problem is that, of course, the right-wingers have to walk through those protesters in order to get into the park. And so most of the violence occurred kind of at that peripheral. As we've seen from other events, like in Berkeley, where there was police and they left the scene and let these two sides fight each other. Hey, how come you guys are hanging back? That would be a good question for the chief of police. What did you see on the ground and how do you think the police conducted themselves today? Mostly the police stayed uninvolved for the first couple of hours. Uh, eventually, the barricades that they had originally set up were taken down by the Antifa. Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe declares a state of emergency. <laughs> then, that terrible moment. when the driver of this gray Dodge mows down a group of marchers who were protesting the rally. 19 people were injured. 32-year-old Heather Heyer was killed. Heather's mother told us her daughter was there protesting white supremacy. The driver was caught by our ABC cameras chanting a message of white power. And we're back, Mike Sermich, Gorilla, mindset.com with a dimly lit periscope and I think I need to fix my hair. We now have in America neo-Nazi terrorists. I wish it weren't otherwise, but when you're driving a car into a crowd of people after attending a neo-Nazi event, then I, you have to call it on both ways, right? right? In a press conference this afternoon, when asked about the events in Charlottesville, Trump had this to say. I think there's blame on both sides. <laughs> All right, it's just like D-Day. Remember, D-Day, two sides, allies and the Nazis. There was a lot of violence on both sides, okay? But how can you talk about the terrorism of the neo-Nazis on the right, but then look the other way when the alt-left is committing terrorism? One is a Nazi white supremacist group. The other is a protest group protesting a political and a racist movement. Maybe their tactics weren't exactly right. Don Lemon goes, well, you know, the alt-left, or the alt-left, Antifa, maybe they have some bad tactics. And they, they, they're whitewashing it. What about the alt-left that came charging at the, as you say, the alt-right? Do they have any semblance of guilt? First of all, sir, the opposite of alt-right isn't the alt-left. <laughs> it's the not-Nazis. But, I'm just, that's just me. I think you got it. No, I don't know. I think let's you got fair. it. No, let's be fair, John. I think you, you got it. You gotta be fair, John. No, that's pretty fair. It's time for the left to actually take a stand. 99.999% of the right is against the neo-Nazis. 99.999% of the left is against the alt-left terrorism, but, but if you're a liberal, if you're a liberal, it's time to start calling this stuff out. Thanks for watching. Mike Cernovich, I'll be back soon. We'll talk more. My life is in danger every day because the media has falsely claimed that I'm alt-right, when I'm clearly not. Red Rover, Red Rover, censor a big shover. I'm not part of that. Do you want a red pill? How about a lead pill? The alt-right may have started out as something different a year ago or two years ago. It may have been about just an alternative to mainstream Republicans, but it has clearly morphed into ultimately an anti-Jewish, anti-everybody hate-filled movement. And so I've said, hey, you guys have free speech rights. I've said the alt-right has free speech rights to go give their talks on public grounds. But I've said if your movement is based on hate, I completely want nothing to do with it. And I said, if you want to throw Nazi salutes, I don't want anything to do with you. Don't come to my event. Stay far, far away from me. The media, though, they call me alt-right to this day. For people who vote for Donald Trump, 
to get lumped in with white supremacists and extremists, it's true in a lot of regards because you have the KKK who are marching the morning after Trump won the election. You have alt-right groups and groups that call themselves hate groups that are holding up Trump signs at their rallies. There were Trump signs in Charlottesville, right? Living in America as a black man, I'm constantly traumatized. I'm traumatized by the statistics that I see. I'm traumatized by what I watch on the news when black people are choked to death. I'm traumatized by what I see on social media. Black men being shot in front of their families by the police and nothing happening. Black men with full carry weapons permits. I'm traumatized. Where's the help for my trauma? Who's addressing my needs psychologically? These are things we don't look at. I'm a freedom fighter, I'm a revolutionary, I'm a Christian, I'm a proud American. Although people won't admit to it, America is a very racist place. It was founded on racial practices and these, are, these practices still exist today. Maybe to the extent that they, not to the extent that they were before, but these racist practices still exist. And if you are a Christian, if you are American, you can look at the facts and say, yes, this is true. That's the mantra and the message of protests around the country. If they only Black Lives Matter, then Black Lives we Matter do not have to say it. A black person gets killed by the police under questionable circumstances. Black people rally. The cop goes to court, and no matter how questionable, it always seems as though the cop walks away. Does this always happen? No, sometimes the cop gets convicted, but it just seems to be a reoccurring theme. There is an aspect of Black Lives Matter which is well needed, very well needed, and that is police misconduct, militarization of police force. The average person there, what do they know about us, right? They know what the media tells them. They say BLM is anti-cop. Boy, do we have an atrocious case of the media twisting things in order to lead people in the wrong direction. It happens to be a Fox affiliate in Baltimore. At this rally in Washington, D.C., participants chanted, we won't stop, we can't stop, so kill a cop. And that is not at all what they said. So the actual chant was, we can't stop, we won't stop, till killer cops are in cell blocks. We won't stop, we won't stop. I'm not anti-cop. There are members of my group who are, right? Because I know, like, I know cops who are, as people, decent human beings. Black Lives Matter has been subject to fake news in the sense that the media does want to sensationalize what is happening. So if there's a big, major protest, then the media isn't going to cover that. They want to cover the 20 people lighting cars on fires flipping things over, committing violence, and other things. Shot fired, shot fired, getting injured officer. There's a difference between a protest and a riot. Burn that motherfucker down. Burn this motherfucker down. Burn this bitch down. So in that regard, a lot of um, people associated with Black Lives Matter have been discredited. But on the other hand, there was a journalist, the Korean American journalist, Tim Pool, who went to cover the protests, which then turned out to be riots, and I believe Milwaukee. One of the first things we hear is the crowd getting angry and saying, you know, what are these white people doing here? Fuck white people. White people suck. And it culminated with an 18-year-old white kid being shot in the neck yesterday, so. That's a problem, and that's a conversation that needs to be had. For those that are perceivably white, it is just not safe to be here, and that's why I'm deciding to leave. They interviewed a girl there who was yelling about how they need to stop the violence in Milwaukee. Thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done. With his sister calling for peace. Don't bring the violence here and the ignorance here. But the other half of that clip was her screaming they need to bring the violence to white neighborhoods. Y'all burning down shit we need in our community. Take that shit to the suburbs. Burn that shit down. 
that is fake news right there and it's happening every day on your TV screen, but it's hard to point out because there are bits of truth within it. I ask people, I go, can you name a high profile a black person who had been shot by police? And people can, they can name a few people, right? And then I say, can you think of a white person who was shot by police? No. I go, well, did you know that twice as many white people as black people are shot by police every year? And they go, well, yeah, but white people are the majority of the population. And it's like, I get the statistics, right? But if twice as many white people are shot as black people, and you can't name a single white person shot by police, what does that say about the media's coverage, right? The first thing you hear when a cop kills someone of color is their criminal history, if they're an alcoholic, they were a woman beater, they were, who knows, when a black person is killed, they're villainized, right? And when a white person is killed, they are victimized. Villainized, victimized, and that's no one else but the media. Do you hear um, the inverse situation of complaints against the media in terms of interracial crimes, like for instance, the Dylan Roof shooting in Charleston, and then there was a shooting in Tennessee that was like, like a black man shot up a church, and, and so right. people were saying, oh, that Charleston shooting got this big media coverage, that shooting got nothing because it was the inverse, you know. So how would you how would you respond to that? Never heard about that. Shit is crazy. This is crazy. I don't understand why I haven't heard of this. Like, that's unbelievable. This is what's funny about the media. All the victims in Nashville were white, but it is not clear whether Samson specifically targeted them based on their race. That's bullshit. Right? <laughs> it's bullshit. And this is this is me talking about a black person who kill white people at church. I don't understand why I never heard that story. And what's more amazing to me is I have over three, I don't know, three, 4,000 friends on Facebook. I've never seen that story published. It's interesting to me. Now, in my view, the media doesn't want to give attention to white people who are shot because then white people might say, oh, it could happen to me too. Maybe I ought to talk to these Black Lives Matter people. Maybe, you know, maybe we can find common cause. The media does not care about black lives. They don't care about white lives. They care about the show. And a Black Lives Matter leader who was reasonable and nuanced and wanted to talk both about rights and responsibilities would resonate with the people. And th that would be refreshing for the media. They don't want people to resonate. The way this, this rally is different, this is one where it, it's family oriented. It, the message is, is positive. We're here to relax. We're here to have a good time. Washington, D.C., we're standing uh, to the right of the stage at the mother of all rallies. And we had just stepped up and people just started booing us, heckling us. We stood there defiantly with our fist in the air, chanting, Black Lives Matter. So they're chanting back, all lives matter. They're, they're making comments. And, you know, we saw a few people who were in Charlottesville and who we had butted heads with uh, a few weeks prior. And out of nowhere, one of the guys said, So what we are going to do is something you're not used to, and we're going to give you two minutes of our platform to put your message out. When I got on the stage, my mind state changed. It wasn't fear. It was God, right? And something said, tell them who you are. I am an American. Yeah. Secondly, I am a Christian. Yeah. The reason why we fight is to draw attention to issues and to fix it. We are not anti-cop. We are anti-bad cop. We don't want handouts. We don't want anything that shows. We want our God-given right to freedom, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. USA! 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 I think I think we really made made some some substantial steps without either side yielding. Here I went from being their enemy to someone they wanted to take pictures with their children, and that's the power of communication. Why doesn't the media 
put, tell us this story. Why? Because people like you and I will sit down and say, let's figure this out. And guess what? It disrupts the establishment. No, no, no. The media is never going to give that guy a platform. They want to give a platform to people that look monstrous because then you keep everybody divided, you keep everybody paranoid, you keep everybody hysterical. That is the problem right now with America is the bubble. You click away and you unfollow, you separate yourself from people with contradicting views, and then you end up with this sort of snowball of your own narrative. Your narrative should be something like, I'm constantly trying to go beyond the truth that I already hold. Because the truth that you already hold is not enough. You need to know more than you know. If you think about what the news is, it, what, what you see in a newspaper or on TV, it's a small fraction of reality, right? There's all the things that have happened. There's all the things that they know about. There's all the things that they decided to write about. There's the things that they decided to write about that you saw, right? And it goes down and down until you're at that individual article. And so you think that when you're reading the news that you're being informed, that you're educating yourself, that you're seeing how the world is, but you're seeing such a tiny fraction of the world. And so uh, you, could, you could argue that in a way the, the media is designed not to inform you, but to keep you uninformed. Um, and that's really scary that, that the bubble that we all live in that has no real higher obligation anymore to this sort of philosophical idea of truth is a scary thing. I can't even agree on reality anymore. It's always a question to some degree which of our partial realities is true and which of them is false. There's a world that exists beyond our comprehension of it and so you have to lay a structure on it in order to simplify it. The role of a journalist is to lay out an unbiased simplification of the situation and to let the viewers, readers, make up their own minds. But if you introduce an act of deception into the world, it stays and it, it manifests itself. When you do that, you, you, you corrupt the structure of the world and you corrupt your own soul. And God help you, it's not good. It's seriously not good. And we know this if you read who I would regard as the most profound analysts of the totalitarian societies of the 20th century. They come to the same conclusion, which is that the totalitarian states would not have been possible without the moral corruption of the individuals within that society. And if you think that through, then it should make you quake in your boots. We have to restructure our value systems, and so that means going back into the past. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Here is no search for truth. The government writes the textbooks, and the children are taught to accept communism and their fate without question. We're at a point where Judeo-Christian ethics can't die, because if it does, then our civilization is done, because its foundation blocks are of that ethic. In the story of Genesis, right at the beginning, is the idea that the essential creative element of divinity is the logos, the word, the truth. And that consciousness calls a world into being through language. That's the image of God in, in man, as far as I can tell. And so, the words you choose determine the structure of the world that you bring into being. So we better get our acts together. We need truth. We need truth in media. We need to open up our eyes. The fundamental question people are going to have, which I have, is how do you know what's true or what's not true? I wonder sometimes if there is a truth that is accessible to us.
Like, I don't know if we can ever know what's truth. Plato's allegory of the cave is one of philosophy's oldest stories and one of its best. In the story, there are people who have lived their whole lives chained in a cave, and they're forced to look at the wall. Now, behind them is a fire, and in front of the fire are various shapes, people, animals, trees. And they see, against the flickering firelight of the cave wall, these shapes, and they think that they're looking at reality. But one day, one of the men breaks his chains and he turns his head for the first time in his life and he looks and he sees the shapes and he sees the fire itself. And it's startling and he thinks that is real. Now I have seen what is real. Before I only saw the flickering shadows. Now I see what is real. But then he sees on the far side of the fire a passageway leading up. Curious, he decides to go up the stairs. And he climbs the stairs one by one, and he begins to see the lights. Not of the flickering shadows, not of the fire, not of the shapes, but of the world itself. And he sees the world for what it is. He sees the actual trees, not the shadows of trees, not the models of trees, the actual trees. He sees the sky, he sees the sun. It all becomes blindingly clear to him, and he realizes that he has spent his life imprisoned into a false reality. We are told by the media what the world is. We are told by the media what is right, what is wrong, what to believe, who to love, who to hate. These are just shadows on the wall of the cave. And then the thought comes to his mind as he regards this beauty, and he says, I must share this with the people below, with my friends, my companions, my compatriots chained in the cave. So he takes a last look to drink in the glory of everything that he sees. And then, with excitement, with joy, with anticipation, he turns back down into the cave. And he starts to tell everyone chained to the wall, this is not real, this is not real, these are illusions. And he reaches down and he tries to break their chains and they do not thank him. They do not praise him, they do not admire his wisdom and his courage. They fight him, and they call him mad, they call him deranged, delusional, disruptive, seditious, dangerous. And he faces the choice, the choice that we all face when we learn the truth. Do we stay? where we are hated, down in the dungeons, among the enslaved, mentally? Do we stay among those fixated on their screens who will not tear their eyes away from a manufactured reality to look at the world itself? Or do we go and climb those stairs again to imbibe all the glory and beauty of the natural world, leaving behind those who fight us for bringing them the truth? I say stand and fight. What is the glory of the world if we must drink it in solitude? What is the beauty of the planet if we must view it alone? We have an obligation, if we have seen the truth, to wrestle the lies from the minds of those stuck in the cave. The cave is the manufactured reality of those who would control us by controlling what we think. But fundamentally, you can't control what someone thinks, because once they think, they are beyond your control. Look at the hell that's been brewing. As they cry, you cheat and you steal. Preaching from one of your limos. They struggle just paying their bills I know you're high and you're mighty Is it best if we all whittle down For fortune and power and devious deeds Winners are chosen, you still won't concede 
final fight for what you believe if it's anything where well, there's proof in the battlefield you suck profits from all that I kill but we've got a faith We're tired of messing around We're tired of losing our feet on the ground So tired we're taking you down And strip you away from that media crown I know you'll keep selling us fear Don't you forget that your ending is near And you know no matter what you say, your hoax is on display. We're alive in your darkest cave, and our fire won't go away. If what's right was on your mind, why's the truth so hard to find? You might be poor, but we're not blind. What you've given is second sight. Look at your tiny retraction You've already gotten the view Those methods that keep us divided How else would you spread your fake news? Chilling your way through a story While calling them scoops on the air We pray for our youth, but why would you care? Searching for honor in all our despair Rather be famous, pretend like you're there And it's never fair So we've leveled the playing fields You'll keep pushing till someone gets killed But we've got our strength back We're tired of messing around Tired of losing our men to the ground. We're tired of screaming out loud. We're tired of living our lives in the cloud. Go on and sell us your fear. But look how we bask in our enemies' tears. As we're told to shut up and let you play with our hearts in a twisted game. While your lies all stay the same And we call you by your name As your hoax is on the run And your lies